So we welcome you today to this uh, webinar entitled Ready, Set, Go, uh, Where to Start Your Assessment Journey, Part 2. Uh, the program is hosted both by SAXA and NASPA Region 3. Uh, you see before you we have some great uh, presenters today. We're excited about the content that they'll share with us. As, you, uh, as we noted earlier, this is, a part, this is Part 2 of a two-part series, and so we've had a great uh, first session and look forward to the continuation of our discussion. Uh, just to let you know, there are other opportunities through SACSA to stay involved throughout the year. The term non-conference infers that we continue to provide educational opportunities throughout the entire um, year and hopefully to provide excellent webinars such as this one uh, moving forward into the days ahead. Uh, in addition, multiple uh, benefits through SACSA membership. There are opportunities to stay engaged through uh, different professional um, um, excuse me, conferences such as the New Professional Institute and the Mid-Managers Institute, as well as some text-based uh, opportunities such as the uh, College of Journals, uh, the College Student Affairs Journal. Uh, looking ahead to next spring, um, there are two noted um, webinars uh, available there that we'll mention. Uh, the Mental Health Collaboration discussion will take place in February, in February and then in April we'll be talking about uh, student athletes. Moving into the summer in June, uh, best practices regarding summer conferencing and then uh, innovation in student affairs moving into September. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to pause at this moment and turn it over to Matt Clifford, who will provide some uh, technical expertise for today, and then Matt will introduce our presenters. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Doug, um, and thanks for joining us today uh, for the webinar. A few quick notes. Um, one, the webinar is being recorded, and we will provide that recording um, to everyone who's attending, um, and also uh, those who um, certainly were have registered but weren't able to attend. Um, that'll be on the SACSA website uh, for for viewing um, offline. And we also will have some materials that the presenters have gathered, and we'll provide those um, a resource list available to to folks as well. A couple of technical notes. Um, Again, being that we've got uh, some panelists today who will be discussing assessment, um, there we hope that there are some engaging questions that you all have, um, have been thinking about or will continue to think about as the presentation moves along. Um, you can send questions in by using the chat feature, uh, which is um, different from the Q&A feature. Um, so you make sure you're using the chat feature on the right side of your window and uh, type your question in the text box and choose to send it to all panelists. That'll make sure that, it, that your question is received by the panelists and they can uh, read that question and respond to it uh, verbally. So that's just a brief technical demonstration. Um, if you have any questions about connectivity or audio, you can also send a chat message to um, me personally and you can select the host and I'll, um, I'll do my best to assist. Um, so without further ado, we'll turn it over to Demetrius Jaggers um, to introduce the program and our panelists. So once again, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Demetrius Jaggers, and I have the pleasure of serving as um, the Region 3 representative on the Assessment Evaluation and Research Knowledge Community um, through NASPA, and uh, looking forward to another opportunity to partner with SACSA to provide some professional development opportunities to, to folks within Region 3 and um, members of, of SACSA. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to let you all know that there are uh, opportunities to get involved with NASPA, um, specifically as it relates to assessment with the assessment evaluation and research knowledge community. And then uh, also we have the opportunity to uh, get connected for, for folks who are in the south or in the southeastern uh, part of the, the country, um, opportunity to get connected with the NASPA Region 3. And Becky, I don't know if you want to kind of briefly just tell folks a little bit about Region 3 and, and ways that they can get connected. Absolutely. <clears throat> NASPA Region 3 is an exciting um, region. Uh, NASPA is broken up into seven regions, and Region 3 is the largest. It spans from Texas over to Florida up to Virginia and, and most of what's in between. Um, we have a number of professional development programs um, that you can read about on our website or, or, or learn through our social media by connecting with us on Facebook um, or on Twitter. 
we do have a fairly sizable board, um, and we are often looking for volunteers. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about how to get connected to NASPA Region 3, my best advice is to connect with us first on social media, because that is where we will promote openings that we have. We do have a current opening um, for our, our Indigenous Peoples KC rep. Um, and I feel certain in the spring we'll have some additional openings. So I'd also welcome you to contact me personally, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you about what you're interested in doing and how to get you connected. Thanks, Becky. So today, um, I want to go ahead and get started with our, our webinar. So Ready, Set, Go, Building Your Assessment Expertise. And um, part one, we, we talked a little bit about um, just where to begin and and how you can uh, begin to to get familiar with assessment. And, and re today we really want to talk about ways that uh, you can focus on developing a skill set, developing um, some competencies as it relates to assessment. And so we, we hope that we'll be able to share some really uh, beneficial information with you um, in, in that regard today. And so, of course, uh, you can't do an assessment webinar without learning outcomes. and. Uh, we'll focus on today um, on identifying resources and tools for developing competencies in student affairs assessment. And also, we hope that through our, our discussion that you all will, will develop some professional goals that will uh, definitely enhance and help you to actualize some of your uh, knowledge of assessment practices. So first, I uh, wanted to introduce our first panelist, Erin uh, Bentram. She's um, at the at Old Dominion University. Aaron, do you want to say hello and just briefly tell folks a little bit about what you do? Absolutely, and I'm uh, glad to be here this afternoon and appreciate all of the participants and panelists. Um, and I am, like you said, the Director of Assessment and Planning for the Division of Student Engagement and Enrollment Services. And what that means at uh, Old Dominion is uh, our division encompasses everything from traditional student affairs units to traditional enrollment management units. So we've got the registrar, financial aid, and admissions all under one division. And I manage the um, assessment and strategic planning for those areas. Thanks, Aaron. Um, secondly, myself, uh, again, my name is Demetrius Jaggers. I um, have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director for Retention and Student Engagement in the Office of Multicultural Student Life um, here at the University of Tennessee. And um, I uh, work directly with our retention and student engagement efforts, so peer mentoring, tutoring. Um, I also have an opportunity to coordinate our departmental assessment efforts and really helping uh, our department um, tell the story of, of the way that we impact student, students on campus and uh, really creating a culture of, of assessment within the department. Hi, I'm Becky Spurlock. I'm the Associate Dean of Students at Sewanee, the University of the South. I'm also the NASPA Region 3 Director, um, and I've worked um, in assessment all of my career, although that's never been formally part of my title or my primary job, and so I bring that point of view to our conversation today. Great, thanks. And uh, we also, um, one of our team members who was not able to get on, on online with us today because of some connectivity issues, but uh, Sophie Tillier, who is a uh, assessment and research analyst at the University of Maryland um, College Park. And so she assisted in gathering some of the resources that we'll share with you all later on um, after the webinar. So once again, the, the million dollar question that everyone wants to know is, you know, where do you begin with with assessment? And uh, I think one, one important uh, way to start is, is really understanding that the, the, um, we, we talk about assessment, we talk about evaluation and, and research, and, and, I, and I've heard folks use those um, in, in concert or, or use them um, synonymously. And I think it's important that we uh, understand that assessment, evaluation, and research are, are not the same. And so with that, um, getting the good understanding that assessment is really all about the improvement of student learning, improving the student experience. The, the main focus, the, 
primary goal of assessment is, is ongoing and continuous improvement. By evaluation is, is more such more so of a, a quality a piece a, a piece that really uh, looks at um, in a six giving a, a overall grade or a final approval related to a process or program. And in research, um, the main goal of research is really to produce new knowledge um, and, and, and understanding the difference between the three of these will will really help, I think, in, in, in getting you kind of along the path as it relates to assessment. Now, the reality is, is that there are some overlapping uh, concepts and ideas, um, and you can use uh, all three in, in order to really impact student experiences, but assessment is, is really about that ongoing continuous improvement, um, always seeking to progress and, and, and a, a strong focus on student learning, student impact, and what students are gaining from our programs, services, and, and activities that we do on our campuses. Becky. Um, <clears throat> This is Becky, and I want to talk to you a little bit about progression in learning about assessment. Um, to, to get back to the million-dollar question, you know, where do, where do we start? What does that look like? And um, it's hard to know where to begin, and, and Demetrius is right that, that pausing to really understand the difference between assessment and evaluation and, and research is really important um, because it will guide what you do next. Um, what you see on the screen is a progression of topics that I have used um, at three different universities. And so, in fact, I've developed um, 60 to 90 minute workshops on each of these topics. Um, and if that's helpful to you, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit more about that with you individually and, and share some of the content that I've developed in those, those areas. But if you had to think about how to move through um, what you should learn in what order, this is what I recommend, that you start with assessment basics. What I, what I consider assessment basics or assessment 101 is, is understanding the difference between evaluation, research, um, and assessment, um, taking a big picture look at why it even matters, why we should do it, what are the motivations for doing it, um, and, and taking a, a big picture look at that. Um, I also recommend at, at the assessment ba basics level is um, is doing a self-assessment or, or surveying the folks that you're working with to get a sense of what they know or where they're comfortable. And, and I am going to be providing a sample um, self-assessment or assessment you can do with your team in the post-webinar materials that you're welcome to use. Um, once you start, that will give you an idea of, of where you need to go next when you have that information under your belt. Um, and I think it's worth spending some time talking about speaking the language and going over terminology. There's a lot of different terminology, and there are a lot of words that people use professionally that generally mean the same thing. Folks that do this will argue about which word they like better, but it doesn't really matter so long as the group that you're working with decide on what words you want to use and making sure that you all are using the same words to talk about the same things. Um, and so spending some time straightening that out will, will go a long way for you. Writing learning outcomes is, is, the, is the basics um, to be able to get past the, the other things that you need to do. And, and in the post wrap up materials, I'll share with you my writing learning outcomes packet um, that you can actually work through. It'll give you some tips about how to do that and will give you some samples and ways that you can construct your own learning outcomes using the ABCD method. Um, after you've got those things down, it's time to then learn a little bit more about methodology. People often want to start with methodology right away. They want to jump into um, that, but it, it's a mistake to do that if you, if you don't have your basics, your, your language, and your learning outcomes um, in place first. Methodology is when you can get into the different ways that you would collect information, um, the level of, of rigor um, that you might use, but you need some understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve before you choose a methodology or learn more about all the different ways you can collect information. That's the most technical part of what you'll learn, um, and again, you can learn that at a variety of levels. Most folks don't need advanced statistics to do assessment. There's somebody on your campus who can run that if you need it. Most of us need 
just the basics to do what we're trying to do. Um, after you get methodology down, you need to talk about how to write reports and how to share results. And, and then I do recommend breaking those up into individual um, content times to learn about that because learning how to write reports for different audiences, um, I do have some sample reports that I can help provide if that would if that would help you. I have a full report and then I have an executive summary um, that I train folks to use and we use them differ, differently for different populations. And then I would tell you that learning how to share results appropriately, not just with key folks on your campus, but with students, with the folks that you work with every day is an important element and, and truthfully something if people master all these things, they still sometimes struggle with. And so taking the time to put some elements in place to teach you how to share results. This is a, for me, it's been a tried and true progression of information to, to teach people to help them gain competency, feel confident about what they're doing um, and become regular assessment um, managers and developers on their own campus. Um, so if this speaks to you, it's one way for you to break out your own learning or to break out others' learning as you move through. And, and if I can assist you with that, I hope you'll ask questions in our question period. You will get some follow-up materials, as I mentioned. And then, of course, I'm happy to consult with you individually as need be. Great, thanks, uh, Becky. Aaron, if you'll go ahead and take us through some of the uh, online resources and websites. Sure, um, and I think on this slide, these are just um, the tip of the iceberg. There are so many different resources available, so we're, we're fortunate in, in that aspect. Um, and, and some things you will find uh, may tend towards academic assessment, but there are some overlapping principles and ideas that you can often uh, glean from uh, academic assessment or institutional research. And that is uh, the first one you'll see on the slide is, is AIR. They've got um, some great information on their website. And if you're not familiar with the National Center for Educational Statistics and IPEDS data, that is something that can be a huge help. Um, it's an overwhelming amount of data, but they've got a data uh, set cutting tool where you can look at your own institution compared to other institutions. So it's a, it's a, a great resource for a lot of different data sets. Um, and you'll see the, the ASH reader um, underneath here and then the NASPA resource list. Uh, and you saw a little bit about that on the first slide. A couple other ones I would like to mention is it used to be the North Carolina State University um, website, Internet Resources for Higher Education, and it has now become assessmentcommons.org, and it's really wonderful. It's one of the, the great go-to resources. There's examples of um, assessment handbooks, general resources, really good uh, websites that you can find. So I strongly encourage you to look at that. It, it also looks, there's some K-12 things, so it's kind of an overarching uh, assessment web page. A couple other places you might find useful is the Association of American Colleges and Universities uh, website. And you'll see there's a lot of different resources on there about um, STEM and higher ed, student success, gen ed, uh, high impact practices, and that's a really good one. And once you get into that, you'll see um, it'll lead you to, to other places. Uh, let me see, there was another one I wanted to share. The Lumina Foundation is also a really good resource. And they are currently working on a couple of different uh, initiatives, the DQP, and that's one, it's the Degree qualification, Qualifications Profile, excuse me. And that may be something you want to, to learn a little bit more about. They've uh, published something called Transformative Tools for Reshaping the System of Postsecondary Learning, and it does look at some uh, assessment pieces in that. Um, one other good one, the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, uh, NILOA, there's a resource library, there's publications, there's a framework. 
so I think those are just a, a few of the the wonderful resources that you can find online. And again, don't forget, you know, your uh, your national organizations um, that may have different pieces, uh, whether it's uh, you know the knowledge community or or whatever else. There's some other good things out there. And Becky, do you want me to move on with the conferences? Yep. Sorry, I thought that was is that me or you? Yeah, um, I, that's you. Sure. Um, here's an example. There's actually on the student affairs assessment leaders. There's a, a Dropbox, and uh, one thing I have done as the chair of the external relations committee is try to put a composite list of all the assessment conferences that are out there in one place, and that's that can be a challenge, but here's some of the, the ones that I have found and that others maybe have found are the um, kind of the ones that are the, you'll get a lot from it. These cover all different levels of skills and abilities, and what you may want to do is simply look, you know, figure out where you are in, in your journey and what kind of skills you need and find which conference works for you. Um, it's a great way to, to learn, to present, and also to network. And that's been one of the things I think where I've gathered so many different of my skill sets over the years is um, seeing what other people are doing on their campuses. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just a, you know, attending things like that can really be a good way to, to get some other ideas and, and creative ways to approach different challenges regarding assessment on campus. Erin, this is Becky. I would chime in and say the other thing to consider is whether or not you should go to one of these conferences as a team. That attending individually is, is good and helpful, um, but I think sometimes gathering a handful of people um, to go together um, and, then, and then use that as a way to get folks trained or to, to take folks that are very interested and give them some additional skills to come back and lead efforts in your division or your department or to just gain some resources. And, and I think that there are a number of these conferences um, that really are designed in a way that you could take a small team. Um, yeah, you can absolutely. So that's something I, I hope you'll consider too. Is it some, That's not something you need to necessarily do every year, but, but it can be a great way to jumpstart your work in assessment. And I think if you have an assessment team on campus, that's another kind of um, a reward or professional development opportunity, here's what we can offer you to further your own skills. And, you know, it helps the professional, but it also helps bring it back to campus. So I, I think you're absolutely right. That's a great opportunity for an assessment team to go. Absolutely. And here's, again, we had mentioned the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders Listserv. I find this is a really valuable tool. There's a lot of great discussion on it. And assessment in higher ed is um, one that's very active, and you'll get a lot of different things, you know, related to um, academic assessment, gen ed, um, and some other good things with student affairs. But you can follow it and kind of uh, weed out what you might need. There's great resources people are coming up with. People are posing questions that can help you in your own work. So those are two that I would highly recommend that you um, that you sign up for. One other uh, great way to learn about assessment, and here's where um, assessment is so relationship driven, is getting to know the others on your campus who are doing similar work. Um, you know, your campus may have a different structure. Some campuses have uh, typically IR, academic assessment, and student affairs assessment into one office. Others are, you know, siloed out and they manage different parts of the university or college. Um, ha having those professional relationships is just so invaluable. Part of it is, is you know what's going on on campus in regard to any kind of assessment projects. And the other thing is, is even getting to know somebody between sharing data sets. 
um, and sharing information, when you've got those relationships established, then people are more likely, you know, to work together. And, and overall, when you've got a strong team like that, it's better. I, I think it makes a stronger university and it makes a stronger student experience for student success as well. So that's a, that's a huge piece of it. And Erin, sometimes those folks have resources um, that that you need to access, and and I think that if you if you're not aware of what currently nationally normed surveys are being administered on your campus, then you're also missing out on some data that is probably already available to you. Right. Um, and so, and often those large data sets or nationally normed surveys are coming out often from your IR department. And so it's important for you to figure out what data do you already have um, that you can access. And then, and then if they're successful with those survey administrations, nearly all of them allow for some additional questions to be added. So, so learning about that by connecting with your IR professional is also a great way to sometimes collect some data without doing a separate data collection process. Absolutely, and it prevents survey fatigue because you don't want too many large ones in the field at once because it's going to impact both response rates. So absolutely, staying in touch with the projects on campus is really important. And I think even uh, gathering a group together for a webinar like this, um, it's another way to advance the, the culture of assessment. And then we talked about some of the uh, assessment listservs as well. But any opportunity you have to have the discussion with colleagues, it, it makes it less scary for people. Um, again, you're building that relationship and that rapport, and anything you can do to, to establish that is, is great. It's great work. Thanks, Aaron and Becky. And, I, and I, just to add to that discussion, I also think it's in <clears throat> excuse me, it's important to connect with folks um, in your registrar's office because they also have access to to, to enrollment and, and other data that you can really use to, to help you move forward in the, in the work that you are doing with students on your campus. So I wanted to take a moment to really talk about ways that you can kind of begin to develop a community of, of practitioner scholars. Um, when I first began my, my work in assessment, um, I attended a conference, uh, the NASPA Assessment and Persistence Conference, and was able to really um, develop some connections there with, with folks. <clears throat> the good thing about some of those conferences is that there's, they're smaller in number, so you, you really have an opportunity to connect and, and, and have some, some, some meaningful discussions um, with folks about assessment. And, and, and so once I uh, was able to come back to campus, I I got engaged um, uh, on social media. Uh, we, some of us, use social media for our own personal use, uh, or even just social use. But I would strongly encourage uh, professionals to to really get engaged uh, with social media, social media from a professional perspective. Um, there's always conversations going on, um, particularly on Twitter, related to assessment, related to student affairs practices. Um, it's just a great way to develop relationships. I've seen folks who have uh they've connected via Twitter and meet up at a conference together for for the first time and it's really a, a great way to get connected with folks across uh the country. And so um, um you may have a question related to assessment. You can go uh, on Twitter and ask the question and use the has hashtag S A S S and uh, folks will respond. You can follow the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders at um, Student Affairs Assess Leaders um, on Twitter, and then also the NASPA uh, Assessment Evaluation Research Knowledge Community has a Twitter handle, and you can follow. And, and um, one of the great things about being on Twitter, um, when we go to the conferences, um, there's always a hashtag, and, and folks are are tweeting throughout the conference, and so even if you're not able to be at the conference, you can still follow um, the Twitter feed and and see what's going on and see what are some some really popular topics. And I found it's a great way to to stay engaged and to to connect with with colleagues and and even to learn to have some some dialogue about uh, student affairs assessment practices um, in that setting. One of the things that I also like to do um, when I'm not at a conference or when I'm not kind of um, 
engage so much in, in the day to day programming and, and things is really take advantage of um the time that that, that you have, uh whether it be a fall break, whether it be a summer break, um and, and read a book. Um, you know, uh I typically build up uh have a um an email folder where I, I'll get fold I'll get uh, articles someone sends out or it comes through a listserv and I'll save them there and, and when I have some free time or have some downtime, I'll read those articles and, and take notes and really helps me to kind of get familiar with what's what's going on and what folks are thinking about as it relates to assessment. Um, I also take advantage of the the, the library here. Um, um, we are fortunate here at the University of Tennessee, a large uh, research institution, and so we have access to uh, a lot of, of books and, and resources through the library, and I would encourage folks to take advantage of those resources and, and use uh, um, that benefit and, and you know check out some books and, and take some time to read a book, maybe a chapter at a time, or you know decide to to read a book over the summer. Um, also, if 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 you're able to, um, some institutes to provide tuition uh, waiver or tuition benefit. You know they, there may be a, a an assessment related class in the higher ed or um, student affairs um, personnel program on your campus, and uh, taking a class is a good way to to get engaged in learning or, or uh, many institutions have certificate programs where you can get a certificate in institutional research or institutional assessment. So I think those are, are great ways to um, begin to uh, enhance your knowledge and your skill set. Um, also, um, one of the things that I've um, been able to do is I go to different uh, conferences. I will uh, you know, take advantage of the discounted uh, professional development materials, books, and and uh, other resources that are available there, um, and and I really take advantage. And I think that's a good way to use some of those um, per diem um, dollars that you uh, may have from from different uh, travels. It's a good way to to reinvest in in your own learning, um, as well as um, in in thinking about that, I've been able to kind of collect a, 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 a nice library of, of resources um, to really help me in, in developing. So the assessment re reconsidered text is a really uh, practical and e easy to read, and it goes um, pretty in-depth into um, assessment and, and the importance of student success. Um, it talks a little bit about the rigor. It talks about methodology. It talks about learning outcomes and so forth, um, the, the building a culture of evidence Building the Culture of Evidence in Student Affairs is a great text, and it's a really um, engaging um, uh, handbook that you can write in and, and um, uh, write your thoughts down in, and, and it's a great way to, to think about how, um, as a department or, or division, you can begin to create a, a culture of evidence. The um, New Directions text, Selected Contemporary Assessment Issues, came out last summer. Um, just talks about some of the, the common challenges and issues related to student affairs assessment. It also has some case studies and um, about how some institutions have um, utilized divisional wide assessment teams and and or inst even institutional wide uh, assessment collaborations. Assessing student learning and development is a great handbook that really uh, walks you through. Uh, various aspects of student learning and, and assessment, and it's a, a great way to, um, you know, you can even just print off a couple um, pages and, and take it to um, a staff development workshop um, or uh, send it out to some folks on your assessment team as a, a way to get folks engaged and, and maybe discuss it at, at an upcoming meeting. And then the, the five things brief, a brief that was put out by the NASPA Research and Policy Institute is a good read uh, as it relates to uh, surveys and how to create um, effective surveys to get data that you can use and, and um, get the feedback that you need from, from students. So these are just a, a, a couple resources and books that, that are out there. There's um, there's a, a exhaustive list out there um, that you can take a look at, but um, these are good places to start. Um, if you really Demetrius, can I... Sure. I'm sorry, this is Erin, I didn't mean to interrupt you. One one that I love that I use, um, like you said, I use with my assessment team is there's a New Directions um, 
uh, issue out. It's called Contemporary Issues and Assessment, and it's fairly new, and it's just wonderful. So I'll do that um, before our assessment team meeting. You know, I'll, like you were saying, I'll shoot out an article, and they'll read it, and then we'll talk about it and talk about ways to, you know, bring the discussion back to our units. But um, it's the New Directions, Contemporary Issues and Assessment, and I, um, I really like that one. That one, that's a good one. Thanks, Aaron. All righty, so um, we want to go ahead and provide um, an opportunity for you all to, to ask questions. Uh, I do appreciate those who um, took the time to complete the survey or had the time to do that. And um, we'll start with a few of the, the, the questions that, that were asked via the, the survey, and then uh, feel free to go ahead and, and text any, or I'm sorry, type in any questions that you might have um, through the chat box. Um, and so there were a few folks who really talk, wanted to know more about how um, you can market results uh, from assessment to various constituencies uh, on campus. So Aaron or Becky, if you want to maybe talk a little bit about ways that um, folks can um, market the, the results and, and of assessment uh, on their campuses. Sure. <clears throat> this is Becky. There are campuses that have pretty sophisticated campaigns out there um, that you could look at. Um, UT San Antonio is a, is a good example. They did an essay listens, and, and they did a hashtag, and they did some cute um, swag. And so they would sometimes just hand out the, the swag, um, but then they would also take just a simple result of something that they learned and they'd send it out over Twitter or Facebook, they'd hashtag it with SA Listens. You know, my advice for getting started is if you have a regular publication that goes to students, if you do a weekly email or you do a, uh, you, you know, you have an update, a social media account, or, or there's something that you're already doing in your communication profile, my, my re advice is that you don't create a separate assessment communication, but that you just pop a box. Um, into one of those communications and just have somewhat regular feedback. We heard you. We listened. You told us this, and and here's what we learned in this result. Um, that's probably the simplest way to do it. It is, in fact, a simple way, but still a hard way because it's something you have to pay attention to. Now, if you have a lot of results, you could preload those, so meaning that you could take some time in the summer and you could decide what are things that you want to share with students. And just like if you wanted to use social media, you could preload those concepts um, into, into a, an application like TweetDeck and then schedule them to go out so that it's, it's automatic. You're not, you're not having to attend to it. I think that's the biggest challenge is if you have to remember to do it, um, it's, it's hard in the, in, the busy, in the busy of the day to remember to pause and look up a piece of data that you want to share. Um, but if you don't let students know that you're – what, that you're getting those results and that you're doing something with them, you're, you're going to see the impact in your, in your response to survey materials. Um, other campuses I've also seen sometimes do town hall meetings once a semester, once a year, where they share feedback in those ways. You might also consider meetings with your student government association or your president's council um, as, a, as a means to get a little more in-depth in sharing results. All of those are effective ways um, to share results without um, being too onerous. Um, Aaron, I, I see a question has come in about survey fatigue. Would you like to answer that one? I know this is an area you know a lot about. Sure, and it, I think she's asking how much is too much, and that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, I think at some point we probably already hit too much. <laughs> on all campuses, and primarily because if you think about students are inundated with information. Um, and one thing that, that we're guilty of in assessment is just doing a survey, let's do a survey, as opposed to thinking of some more um, direct measures or more qualitative measures. The, w one of the, the ways you can prevent survey fatigue is obviously, you know, not over-surveying, keep it short, don't ask questions that you're not going to use. They're, they're, you know, don't waste the respondent's time asking something that you're not going to do anything with the data or the responses. 
Um, and you need to make sure your questions are good questions that, you know, they're it draws them in, um, they want to fill it out, and I think that relates back to, again, what we were talking about with letting students know, here, this is what you said, you know, otherwise they feel like it's going into this black hole, they're filling out surveys, but nothing ever happens. Um, so I think advertising those, those things, um, like Becky was saying, is really important. Generally, what, what I have found, and I don't know if, um, Becky, smaller schools are, are any different, but right now we're seeing generally 10 to 12 percent response rates on our surveys. And that's, you know, if we hit 15 or 18, I mean, it's a good day, but it, it's just, again, partnering with others on campus to be sure you have a university-wide assessment plan. And I think that's really key. You know, don't do separate large surveys all at the same time. Work together as a team to figure out uh, what can we piggyback on? How can we, you know, pull these random samples, you know, so to work together with others on your campuses? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. You know, I, we have been pretty fortunate in, in the campuses I've worked on, the small and medium size, that we've been able to hit pretty close to 30 percent. Um, but but I would say we, we really do manage it. And I, I do think about um, does it need to, we, we so quickly want to go to an electronic survey, and I think you really have to ask, how important is this data? Um, how much do we need it? How long is it? Um, and I'm a big fan of figuring out that there are some surveys where you just need the information that you should probably do it on paper and find a way to create a pinch point for students to do that. You can't go to that well very often, but it can be highly effective when you need to. Um, and then I'm also a big fan of the quick survey, and, and, and the, but to do that um, frequently, like with donuts and coffee in the morning, create a table, ask people to stop by, say we have three questions. And they're what I call pulse surveys. If there's something you need to gather mm -hmm. quickly, you'll actually do better um, if you can set up a quick table and give out donuts and coffee or, or candy or treats or something and collect, you know, I would say you don't get much more than three questions. Um, than another electronic survey. Um, I think you also, people need to start by looking and seeing do they already have this data and don't realize it. Um, and that is often the case as well. Um, but when you, you have to find out what's been the typical or normal response for surveys, and one of the ways that you know you're in this survey fatigue place is you see your response rates going down. Um, and that's, that. And by that point, you're already in survey fatigue. Right. <laughs> you know you're, you're too late. Um, but, but at least you know, and then you can pause and really say, you know, where are we and what do we need to do? Um, bigger universities, I'm aware of, of uh, Texas State and San Marcos, they, um, at least at one point, had a pretty great system where they made a promise to, to all students that they wouldn't get more than, I don't remember the number, if it was one survey a semester or three surveys. And then they, they tracked using this a large campus, they used randomized populations, and they used a randomizer then to mark out those students who'd received a survey. Um, and so when other surveys needed to be done and were also random, they were able to parse out their population. If you're on a bigger campus, I think that's a, that's a remarkable technique to use. Thanks, guys. Um, another question that was sent in via the survey is, uh, folks are just interested in learning more about um, some of the tools and technology that's being used. And I'll, I'll start uh, briefly, but um, Aaron and Becky, feel free to to chime in. Okay. <clears throat> one of the things, one of the tools that I use it, um, it's a it's a really good way to get to kind of get creative with with assessment. Um, it's called Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere um, um, provides the opportunity for folks to use their cell phones to kind of text in, and it's a great way. To, to engage folks in an event if you're trying to get some, some feedback uh, at an event, during an event. Um, it's a, a really good, uh, useful tool. Now, uh, one of the um, disadvantages of that service is that you can only uh, use it for free uh, with 40 respondents. So any any group over 40, you'll have to um, pay for a an annual membership. Uh, Campus Labs is, is also a great a tool, our institution, within the vision of, this, of student life uses campus labs. And of course, there is some um, uh, funding that, that contributes to that, but it's a great tool to 
um, not only to collect data from from students, but also to to analyze it and to put it in a, in a in a way that you can share it with students, share it with faculty, staff, and other uh, constituents uh, on campus. Uh, Qualtrics is a is a great uh, tool. It's a little bit more advanced, but it's a great way um, to to collect um, survey data to to utilize it for analysis. Um, there's there's tons of other tools out there that that can be used. Um, um, but sometimes you'll have to work um, with other departments and offices if it's a a, a a tool that you need to contract out. Um, but uh, Becky and Aaron, if you guys want to talk a little bit more about some of the other tools that are sure. available. One thing that we use um, at ODU, which I just love, and we've had uh, really good luck with it, we use uh, swipe machines. And they're easy to use. They're relatively inexpensive. And we started last year kind of piloting uh, students who participate in certain activities or if they're a member of a student organization. So we're able now to start gleaning some information from swipe data that what happens when the student swipes in, it simply is um, a CSV file of UINs. And then I can, can, can excuse me, I can't speak, connect that back to Banner and get a lot of demographic information about students. We can find out, you know, students who are participating, are they um, retaining at a higher rate, you know, persisting at a higher rate. And it also gives us information about programs. If we see, you know, there's a certain demographic that's attending only one type of program, what does that mean for our, um, our events and our programming needs for our students? So I've been really excited about the possibilities of using um, the swipe technology. Yeah, I think the swipe technology is, is a great way to collect a lot of information in an easy way. Um, all the, the things that my colleagues have talked about are all the same tools um, that I've used over the years. Um, I do think that do, there are campuses out there that still are using SurveyMonkey, and, and that's okay. I mean, if that's where you need to start, there's for some people who use that as a free resource or for a small subscription. It's not my favorite, um, but it can get the job done um, if you need to. Um, one, of the, one of the other free um, tools, and I don't think sometimes um, folks think about it, but you can also uh, use Google. If you're creating a Google form or um, for an application, we use it for our peer mentor application. We recruit peer mentors, and there's it's a good way to collect information from students. And um, Google has a uh, analytics tool, uh, kind of on the back end, and you can go in and, and look at student data. For instance, um, we have a peer mentoring program where we pair up incoming students. Um, and um, we had about 150 students complete the application, and one of the questions we asked on the application is um, the first-generation status. And so Google automatically um, puts that um, that number together, and so I'm, a, I'm able to tell instantly how many of those students uh, are defined, uh, are first-generation college students, and it actually puts the um, the data in, in, in charts and things of that nature. So um, that's that's another way to, to really uh, get some easy information and, and, and data from, from students as well. It looks like we have a um, question um, about IRB approval for collecting data. And what but, um, I think the question is uh, when do we need IRB approval? When is it appropriate to make sure we have IRB approval when we are collecting data from students? Erin, do you all have a standard that you use? With yeah, your... we, we generally, in each university, um, I find is a little bit different. Some are more stringent than others. A good general rule of thumb is if you're using it for program improvement internally, you do not need IRB approval. Now, I have been at campuses where that may be the case, and you need to apply for IRB exempt status. So I think it's important to learn um, about your, your particular campus, uh, what the protocol is, find out who your representative may be, and have that, that discussion with them. Um, 
generally if it's something like you know a satisfaction survey or feedback or something like that it, you generally do not need it but that's something i would be you know sure to talk with your office um on campus about yeah and just to go to make sure that that was a piece that that you said was that um there is there is a committee on your campus and if and and sometimes that committee is broken out so that that there are representatives for different areas. And, and so if you don't know who those folks are, um, go to your webpage and see. Um, but you can have a quick conversation with the chair. Um, your IR folks can guide you as well, but, but it's often a committee made up of faculty members. Um, and so it's helpful opportunity to have a conversation um, and to, to gauge on your campus what that looks like. Most of the campuses I've worked on, very little of what we've done has needed to go through IRB. Um, but I think Erin's right. It is there are some cultural issues on a campus that make that decision um, about the approach of the committee. We have a, a couple more questions from our uh, survey. Um, there was one question in relate in, in regards to new ideas for assessing student learning. Um, and I, I think some of the ways um, that you can really think creatively about assessing student learning, um, I, I mentioned the resource or the tool Poe Everywhere is a great way to get feedback from students uh, instantly um, related uh, to programming. Uh, we've also used Twitter, um, used the hashtag to have folks tweet about uh, uh, their experience, their learning. Um, um, so that's a good way to, to be creative about using the assessment. I know. Um, we also do um, one minute uh, or two minute papers, and so um, instead of doing a, a, a full post um, assessment, perhaps you uh, think about two two really uh, key questions. You know, have students list. You know, what are three uh, what are three things that you gain from this event, or three uh, things that you can learn from this event, and really allow students to kind of reflect uh, internally to provide that assessment. Um, and there, there are a variety of ways. Uh, Aaron and uh, Becky, you guys have any other thoughts about uh, ways that um, folks can assess student learning in a co-curricular? I, I think ahead, it Becky. helps in particular if you know if if you know what you're trying to assess. So if you're if you're in your co-curricular program, do you already have learning domains or? Um, or outcomes that you're trying to share. Um, and if you have those, you can spend some time mapping out the way that you'll collect that data. So often it won't necessarily have to be from student satisfaction or student feedback. Um, you can go to other wells in terms of participation data. You might look at um, reflection data. You might look at other surveys that are already being done. So. I think the thing is, if you're just starting to say, well, we need feedback, and you go immediately into methodology, you've skipped a step, um, and, and you may need to back up um, before thinking about how you're going to next collect that. Erin, I think you were jumping in there as well. Yeah, no, I agree exactly with um, what you what you just said. I think there's um, a, a good process to go through in, in creating those. Yeah, I, I worry about that sense of just kind of jumping right into something else um, instead of really thinking about what, if you're trying to measure the co-curricular, what is it that you're trying to measure and how does it connect to, you need a bigger picture plan right. rather than just jumping into the, to the details. doing individual, yeah, I, I think, what, yeah, getting out of the weeds a little bit is um, maybe a good way to put it. You know, what's the overarching question and picture? What, what are you trying to do? Yep, I agree. Great, well, well thank you guys again for, for attending today's webinar. Um, I'm looking at the chat box and I don't see any uh, other questions. So um, if we don't have any other questions, uh, go ahead and um, close out. Of, um, Matt and Doug, if you guys wanted to. Great, thanks, Demetrius. We certainly appreciate the content and the uh, information you and 
Becky and Aaron have shared today, we are better prepared to address assessment and uh, certainly know the resources and avenues to pursue it uh, further. So thank you again. Uh, again, if, uh, if you've attended today's session and are uh, encouraged to participate more, please visit the uh, SACSA website to determine other upcoming webinars, as well as check out the uh, NASPA Region 3 web, uh, website for additional professional development opportunities. Uh, this will conclude uh, this session and our session for the fall. Uh, we hope you have a great Thanksgiving and look forward to you joining us back in the future in the spring. Thanks and take care. Uh, the session is over for today. Thank you. Sure.